So, last time we talked about the rabbit hole metaphor, which is the way I explained the never-ending human quest for anchoring knowledge on something universal, something that we can be sure that uh, true knowledge exists and from which we can construct more knowledge. And I said that so far we found none. Um, and then I told you that we are going to visit some highlights of this uh, history, uh, which is King Solomon and then the Greeks and then the empiricists on the 17th and 18th century, and then in the 20th century, Karl Popper. But before we go there, we are going to talk about evolution and specifically the theory of evolution by Darwin in the 19th century. And I want to begin here because by the end of this part, we are going to understand better what I meant by, <clears throat> by metaphysics. We will not understand it fully, but we will understand enough to appreciate the rabbit hole cycle. All right. Now, this class, this part, I think, is the most interesting, challenging and important part of my entire introduction. Maybe even the entire course, I don't know. Um, and it's important because it's useful, the ideas we'll talk about are useful for everything in life. I may be exaggerating. No, I, I am convinced that I'm not exaggerating, but let's see if I convince you. Not only for understanding evolution per se of species, but also it will be useful for understanding society and ourselves, our emotions, our identity, our choices, decision-making, everything. I'm promising the entire world. Let's see if I, if I deliver. So, beyond that, I think that for scientists, for anyone that deals with, with science, this is a precondition. It should be the first thing we learn in the first class of anything. For us, it will be as... Okay, okay, okay. Now, it's also a tricky... Uh, it's a tricky class because seemingly we are going to talk about something that most of us think that we know. We, we, we learned it in, the, in, in school. We learned it many places, like it's a simple story. It's not a complicated theory. But the critical point is what may seem a nuance. And it's not a nuance, it's really critical. And that will be my challenge to fully convince you to explain you this nuance, this not nuance, um, and afterwards, by the end of this uh, part, to try to connect it to all the other stuff that I said that it is relevant for. Okay, so in this part, I don't know if it will be, it will be long, so I don't know if it will be one class or two classes, let's see. But what I want to cover is like this. First of all, we are going to understand fully the theory of evolution. Uh, we then are going to understand what the theory of evolution is not about, what it doesn't say, specifically we are going to understand why... So, when we think about the theory of, of evolution, 
um, the way we were taught, we think about Mother Nature is the scientific, the, 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 the first, the most prominent scientific um, description of the forces of nature, of Mother Nature. So I will try to convince you that it's exactly the opposite. The theory of evolution is the opposite from the concept of Mother Nature. And then, in the end, I will try to connect all the ideas into, I will extrapolate to a lot of things and try to bring it to relevance in our daily life. Um, you already know the drill. I am going to say things that initially will not be clear and then gradually I'll go around and come back from another perspective and slowly it will become clearer and clearer. All right. I, uh, I'm excited about it. I, uh, <laughs> I really love talking about this, uh, this stuff. Anyways, and, and the funny thing is that in the end of this part, I'm going to tell you that the theory of evolution is not even a scientific theory. It's not even a theory. We'll get there. So, okay, let's begin. Charles Robert Darwin, who was a British geologist and uh, uh, biologist. He uh, was born in 1809 and he died in 1882. And during uh, the middle, I don't know, the 1850s, uh, maybe 40s, 50s, he spent a long time in a, in a ship uh, sailing all around the world. I think he spent something like five or six years uh, recording and in, in a diary everything he saw, um, mainly about geology, but on the way things, I don't know, stuff that he saw, <laughs> Uh, about uh, species. So the, the famous stories uh, in the Galapagos, which is an island that has been for, I don't know, I'm just throwing numbers, millions of years disconnected from the mainland. And then he could, uh, he could by this separation in years, he could really see differences in traits that evolved by uh, common ancestors of the same species. Um, okay, and then he came back to England and he was already a very famous uh, uh, researcher and he was very well connected and he wrote a book called the, uh, On the Origin of Species. It was published in 1859 and it was one of the rare occasions when a new revolutionary idea, theory, it's a theory, in the end we'll discover it's not, but it was proposed as a theory and many people still think it is. Um, and which challenged the big guns, the mainstream uh, accepted ideas of the day uh, meaning that it annoyed a lot of important people. And within 10 years, which is a very short period of time, everybody accepted the theory of evolution. Uh, very few cases in history, a, very, a, a, a new, completely different idea, macro idea, is accept, was accepted so fast. Other example maybe was Einstein with the... Uh, well, maybe it's a little bit different. Anyways, so um, we know the story. There are mutations. Every species go through random mutations in its DNA material. And then some of these mutations, they express themselves into slightly different traits. And then these traits 
whenever they provide an advantage for the individuals with those new traits or, or new versions of traits, when these new versions provide an advantage for survival, for adaptation in the surrounding of that, of that species, then they survive more, they procreate more, so they bring more offsprings, and all those offsprings, they have the same, most of them have the same traits, and along zillions of generations, this trait becomes, dominates the, uh, the, the entire uh, species. Okay, makes sense. Uh, the adaptation, we know the name, it's natural, by natural selection, meaning the nature, the surroundings, select the traits uh, offered by the species, by the mutations. All right. Now, I remember, I really remember, when I was taught, I don't remember when was it, I don't know, I was, I don't know, in school somewhere. Uh, I remember that my teacher explained that that's why we don't have body hair, most of us, uh, we don't have body hair and we don't have claws anymore. And she explained because the, during the generations, during zillions of years, we less and less used, we didn't need it anymore because we started to cover ourselves with fur, so we were not cold anymore, so the hair was not necessary. The same for claws. And our soft nails are remnants of that not needed anymore claws. Problem. So the implied assumption behind this explanation is that evolution is about function, uh, functionality, is about utility, is about improvement, meaning Mother Nature is improving us. Eh. Um, so, if you remember, I claimed that a metaphysical construct, a metaphysical explanation, is based on two tenets. First, that there is an entity that is beyond us, above us, and prior to us, that we don't understand. And the second thing, that this higher, this entity that we don't understand has a master plan. So in this case, Mother Nature is doing something to us, is improving us, is worried about our functionality. One question, okay, I'll, I'll stop for a moment and jump to the metaphysics of God. One of the main straightforward questions that a child, when, when a child learns, uh, when a child learns that God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient, uh, omnipresent uh, is God is everywhere omnipotent, God can do everything. And omniscient, God knows everything. So the first question is, if God is all that, why not upfront create a perfect word? And God wants us to behave in a certain way. Let's say in Genesis, with the fruit of knowledge, God didn't want Adam and Eve 
to eat the fruit of knowledge. So why God created Adam and Eve as already not to eat? You can do whatever you want. Why, why God is testing? Why God is creating something that is imperfect and that... Okay, so the answer is God's tortuous ways. We don't understand God. We cannot understand God. Bring back to Mother Nature. The same question is like this. And, and, that, and, and I, I, I was worried about this question since I learned about evolution. I don't know, the, the age of 10, 11, I don't know when. Until, I don't know, 25 years later, the third, when, when, when I read a book, actually, I, remember, I don't remember which book, but I remember that when I read it. Okay, well, never mind. So the question is like this. If we humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, are the epitome of evolution, we, if we are the best version of Mother Nature came up with so far, how come we don't have wings. Why are we stuck with two legs? At least for, I don't know, something better. This mode of transportation is obviously not the best one. Why, you know, every little piece of shit in nature has two wings. Why can't we also? Why, what, what's going on with the improvement stuff? It's the same kind of question. So, the only answer is we don't understand Mother Nature's master plan. That's the metaphysical answer. And that's not our answer. So I'll jump directly to the final point, to the conclusion that we we'll reach, I don't know, in half an hour or one hour, I don't know, is that evolution is not about progress. Evolution is not about improvement. Evolution does not have an a priori goal. There is nothing about functionality, utility and progress in the process of evolution. Let me stress it. Evolution is not guided by anything, is not trying to arrive at a better anything. There is no master plan. Evolution is not a principle, it's, evolution is not a force. The theory of evolution is a description of what happened. The process of evolution is completely passive. There is no force in an active way. No force thrusting, pushing towards a result. We sometimes hear on television very successful uh, scientists. Uh, lately we hear all the time uh, the coronavirus has the interest of not killing its hosts. That implies that the coronavirus has an objective, has an aim, wants to achieve something. That is a misconception. Now, later, we'll come back to that. Why uh, the best scientists find themselves expressing uh, in such a way. But we'll come back to that later. First, let's understand the theory of evolution deeply. Okay, so the theory of evolution is based on two basic tenets, random mutations and natural selection. Let's begin with the mutations. So what are mutations? Our intuition about mutations is uh, a bug, a bug in the, in the firmware. And it is, they are errors. So our cells, all our cells, they do 
stuff. They do things all the time. And these things, they do according to instructions, which is our DNA sequence. So every cell, whenever it wants to do something, it goes to the right part of the DNA sequence, reads the instructions and does whatever it does. And then in this process, there are errors. So just for you to have uh, an idea of how, how, how frequently it happens. So in humans, it's estimated that for each cell every day, there are around 10,000 errors per day each cell. In rats, it occurs something like a hundred times, a hundred thousand errors per day per cell, which means that it's, it happens all the time. We are all the time, uh, our cells are making errors, which may in some cases result in mutations. Now, Mutations occur through five independent processes, which are tautomerism, depurination, deamination, sleep strand mispairing, and replication slippage. Again, tautomerism, depurination, deamination, sleep strand mispairing, and replication slippage. Now, I'm not going to explain to you now what these processes are. First of all, because they are absolutely irrelevant for us. And second of all, because I don't know a flying scheisse about it. I just found it in Wikipedia and I spent many minutes learning it by heart. Look, I'm not reading. Tautomerism, depurination, deamination, sleep strand, mispairing, and replication slippage. I can, I can even say from the end to the beginning, look, uh, slippage, replication, mispairing, strand, slipped, deamination, depurination, tautomerism. Okay. Uh, so you may ask, how come there are mutations. Uh, why do they occur? So I'm not going to answer right now. I'm going to go back. Uh, we are going to talk about it later. But what we want to remember right now about mutations are like this. First of all, not every error, most errors, they are meaningless or they are corrected afterwards. Only few errors, they result in a change in the phenotype. Phenotype means the characteristics, the attributes of an individual. It can be physical, it can be behavioral, but something that changes, something observable in the individual. This is one thing. The second thing is that mutations occur in one individual. So evolution, meaning changes in the phenotype of a species, the phylogenic uh, changes, philo meaning uh, species, genic development, so the phylogen phylogenetic changes that occur through evolution, they all begin in one ontogenetic change. Ontogenetic is the individual. So it goes like this. One individual goes through a mutation that is one of the rare occasions occasions that that mutation results in a phenotypic change, something changes in that individual. And that individual now usually or probably always one single mutation 
does nothing. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not that one day there is a mutation and then one wing appears. It's, I don't know, some, a feather grows. A feather is neither an advantage nor a disadvantage for any individual. But if that change does not result in a disadvantage, then many or most of the offsprings of that individual who also have a feather in their back. As long as that feather doesn't pose a disadvantage for those offsprings and the offsprings of the offsprings, nothing happened. So think the feather for generations. And then, by chance, because mutations occur, some of those offspring sometime will have a mutation upon that mutation. So some of them, because it's absolutely random, some of them, the mutation will make that feather disappear. The other one will make that feather, uh, I don't know, not feathery. But if, by chance, there are mutations on that feather that makes more feathers uh, and those more feathers continue to not pose a disadvantage for those individuals, then through generations, if by chance there are more mutations that make the feathers more larger and after zillions of zillions of generations suddenly there are two little things that help a little bit with the movement with the then reminds me of uh, sorry uh, we are still uh, happy no no politics anyways um so uh so after very so so in the moment that it begins to give to, 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 to render an advantage for those individuals of the little thing, then natural selection begins and those individuals will start to procreate more than to survive more and therefore procreate more than the other individuals of the same species that don't have these little uh, weakness. So, a phenotype development not only takes a lot of time, but by chance, a lot of different things have to happen. Mutations upon mutations. And the interaction of those phenotypic chance, uh, changes do not uh, pose a problem for those individuals until it begins to give s some advantage. So, it's a long process and it's by pure chance. So there are three main determinants of, uh, of the development, the, the, the changes through which a given species go through, like uh, a philo, the phylogenetic uh, evolution of a given species. So first of all, the rate of mutations. Each species has different rates of mutations. Uh, second of all, the environment within they live. So uh, the environment is all the time changing, randomly, just as well. So a very stable environment poses less uh, challenges for adaptation for a given mutate, for a given species. Um, and the third is how many offsprings a given individual has throughout its life. So, I don't know, rabbits throughout their lives, they do it every couple of months and every time they have 15 little rabbits. Uh, on the other extreme would be uh, the Upper West Side ladies in my Tinder, which maybe one day want to have one child, probably adopted. So uh, the more offsprings a given species has, 
and the more mutations it has, the more options to adaptation it has along the generations in a given environment. Uh, so that's why um, the Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, is so popular for researching genetics and biology because they are hornier than rabbits and they do it all the time and they have a lot of offsprings every time they make love and they also have only four pairs of chromosomes so it's it's very comfortable for uh, research in biology you see changes very fast and you can control uh, what happens because you have only four pairs of uh, of genetic material uh, there were six nobel prizes awarded to research based only on Drosophila, Drosophila melanogaster. Great fly. And now we are getting to the crux of the story. And the crux of the story is in this little word random. Random mutations. So irrespective of the mathematical formalization of what is random, as if I knew it, uh, what we considered no, random means unpredictable. We cannot predict the sequence of events. We are not aware of any pattern according to which changes will occur. The fact that we are not aware of such a pattern doesn't mean that there isn't. Maybe tomorrow we'll discover. But for now, we don't know any. Okay. Now, random is also infinite. Let me prove it to you. You have something. Anything. Abstract, physical, whatever. You have something. Any change to this something is infinite. Why? Because this is not changed, it's only this, and everything else is this changed. So this changed is anything that is not this, meaning infinite options. Let me say in another way. Um, whenever a change can occur by means of addition. This is a thing. You add something to this, it's a change. Addition is infinite. You can al also add more and more infinite. More probably, any DNA can be mutated by an addition, by an addition of another pair of chromosomes, which means that any change to a given DNA is infinite. A random changes to a given DNA uh, uh, sequence is infinite and, un in and unpredictable. Okay, now, so what we have is a species all the time randomly changing to infinite directions, infinite optional directions. So it's changing all the time and the environment is also randomly changing to infinite options all the time. Now, you may think, wait, in the environment, there are things we can predict. That's true. There are some inner patterns in the environment. For instance, uh, in the last decades, we have been predicting warming. And yes, we can predict warm, uh, uh, the rising of temperatures. But that's only one pattern within the entire environment, which goes through 
infinite number of random changes by the very fact that the environment is includes other species and these other species go through equally randomly infinite changes infinite possibilities of changes already means that the environment is also changing randomly into infinite options all the time so what do we have here we have an entire system an entire universe that is constantly changing into randomly into infinite directions which means first of all that we cannot predict where it goes the theory of evolution cannot predict anything for the future remember what i said before the theory of evolution is only a inside explanation the theory of, of evolution is a description of what has already happened now you may say something you may say something the fact that we cannot predict how changes will go doesn't mean that there isn't something to be predicted doesn't mean that there is we right now we don't have any empirical or logical hint to assume any master plan of anything it doesn't mean that there isn't maybe one day we'll discover one maybe uh, god is doing everything but as long as we don't have a logical or empirical hint about any master plan any possible principal master plan is equally valid meaning equally invalid so the choice of any one of them it doesn't matter if it sounds more close to our heart like the forces of nature or aliens in the planet of zorg zorg any one of those optional principles master plans are equally valid slash invalid we could just as well explain it by i don't know throwing dice so as long as we don't have any reason to adopt a master principle we must not i still haven't explained it i'm just repeating this phrase in the continuation we will, we will understand why the adoption of a master plan about which we have no hint is harmful wait now let's talk about progress why evolution is not progress okay if it's random if there is no master plan so you already feel that it's going nowhere predetermined so if there is no a priori objective so we cannot call it progress we cannot call it improvement we cannot give any valence to anything valence meaning good and bad and for that for us to 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 understand it better i prepared a very complex demonstration of what evolution is all right so this is my demonstration so what we have here is is the universe this is the universe and this is a frozen moment in time okay uh, I, I, I pressed pause in time and this is a frozen moment in the history of the universe so until we got there here 
So many things have been happening. Uh, there were mutations. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So we have here different species. We have hard-boiled eggs. We have arugula. We have these guys, and we have carrots, and we have little tomatoes, and we have. Uh, these are these are the same species. They are two uh, different kinds of species. Okay, so um, so that's our uh, our universe. And now let's unfreeze and let's continue with the with time. So things happen and t t t and then uh, these guys they start to grow horns, little horns, little little, little horns. You want more horns? Let's give more horns. These are hard horns. Look, little horns. You see, these are little horns. Okay, so these guys have little horns. These guys also have little horns. More horns to everybody. And then we have these guys have big horns, big, they have many horns like this, and then the horns become like this, and you also want horns, and then, you know, and, and, and things are happening here, and generations, these are already not the same guys that were before, oh, this got instinct, no more, and uh, and these are uh, millions of years, generations. They they are different people, and the hard uh, and the and the and and things are happening. Ah, and these guys have now wings because everybody has wings, and these guys also want wings. You see, I am nicer than Mother Nature. I give wings to everybody. Wings, and that one went to the wings for everybody. And then we have a new, we have a new, new species, new species. And then we suddenly have, um, ah, we have an ice age, ice age, ice age. So we have a lot of snow, more snow, snow, I like snow, and then we have, and then the water rises, the water rises, and then there is a lot of water rising, and, and the oceans, and then these, and then, uh, and then, and then, and then the hard-boiled eggs went through mutations and they are not hard-boiled anymore. They are... No. I, I covered my computer because I knew that things would happen. And for all the cinematographers among you, you will appreciate that I have only one take for this thing. Okay, and then things happen. And then, and then, oh, oh, we have, and then we have Obama, because he's as cool as a cucumber. And then what else we have here? Oh, and we must be apolitical, so we also have little Trump. We have little Trump. And then we also have Ivanka. Where's Ivanka? We had Ivanka somewhere. Well, not surprised. Every time things get ugly, Ivanka disappears. But we have Jared. We have little Jared. Okay. Um, and then things happen. And what else can happen here? Ah, we have volcano, volcano, volcano erup eruptions. All right. And then I am. Okay, so now you tell me. Oh, there is another egg. Okay. Now you tell me. We freeze the universe again. Okay, now you tell me. Is this better? Is this improvement? Uh, is there anyone here 
better off than its ancestors? I don't know, maybe the carrots like it because it's all slimy and orgy vibes. I don't know, but maybe the, the, the eggs are broken. So, why should Mother Nature choose to improve the situation of one species but make it worse for another one? I don't know. Uh, is there any progress here? No, we can, there is no criterion to decide what's happening here. So, things are just randomly happening all the time. There is no, no, no criterion for improvement, for progress. There is no, no master plan. Obama is a tough cookie. All right. Um, and, and you know what, even you, you, said, you said that the eggs are now broken, but who said that they are not enjoying more? Who said that uh, these eggs, they, they have nothing to, they don't know how to compare. This is the life these individual, individuals know. They don't know how is it to be an egg inside a shell. They only know this and look. Now they are all fluid, they are gender fluid now, they can express themselves however they want. So, uh, so we cannot say better in any way for any advantages and disadvantages, even that we cannot say. Uh, it's like, uh, could you, could you compare your life, who you are, to your life if you were uh, Homo erectus? How can you say it? We cannot know. I don't know. I don't know how life was back then. Uh, I, I'm sure there are many people that would love to live in a world full of erectus everywhere. Um, it's like it's like um, it's like asking who would you be if you were someone else. How can you answer that? It's impossible. Uh, let's say you are a hardcore Democrat. Would you prefer to be a hardcore Republican? No, but if you were a hardcore Republican, you would see the world completely different and you would prefer to be a hardcore Republican. We have, we are, we have only one picture. We cannot compare to anything else. And, and, and this is the word that we don't, thanks God, uh, don't live in it anymore. But, but, but things are happening. Things are not improving. Things are only randomly changing all the time. Um, okay, so let's talk now about natural selection. So you tell me. Who is selecting what according to what here? There is no selection. There, there, what, selection, selection is a, natural selection is a very misleading term because it implies that there is something selecting something according to something, which means this is our, you remember when I said that we are so attracted to metaphysics that sometimes it creeps under. It, 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 we unwittingly, unconsciously, we, we explain something metaphysically uh, because we, we, we have the need to have a representation, an order, the universe must have an order and we feel and, and and then look even in the in the most uh, un, un metaphysical theory the the theory of evolution <coughs> natural selection implies the mother of the mother of the metaphysics implies that there is a nature selecting according to its master plan. Okay, but we, 
we'll continue with the evolution, with the theory of evolution, uh, and we'll disregard this unfortunate choice of terminology, which uh, natural selection, we don't need it. We can continue with the concept of evolution that is, evolution is a hindsight description of what has already happened. Uh, and, and, and by the way, the word natural is also very misleading, because if you qualify selection as natural, a selection, this selection as natural, you are implying that there are selections that are not natural. We'll, we'll talk a lot about it in the continuation, but not now. Now, I just, I, I, I suppose some of you are thinking that I am resorting to too much slapstick and gimmicks and I couldn't possibly go any lower than that. Well, I can. Easily. Automerism, depurination, deamination, slip sliding away, replication, slippage. Ah. Ow, there was a toothpick here.